Welcome to another episode of The Unseen Paranormal, where some of the scariest things are unseen. I'm your host, Eric Freeman. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Today we're chatting with supernatural historian, author, and researcher Troy Taylor. Troy has authored almost 90 books on ghosts, hauntings, history, crime, and the unexplained. He is also the founder of American Hauntings Ghost Tours, has appeared in many documentary productions, and is the co-host of American Hauntings Podcast. In 2006, Troy released the first edition of his book, The Devil Came to St. Louis, The True Story of the 1949 Exorcism. In September 2021, he re-released the book in a new uncensored version that reveals more of the story and the real names of the people involved. Today, we're going to talk about these events that inspired the movie The Exorcist. Hey, Troy, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me on. So like I said, you just re-released your book in an is this the third edition? Yeah, it, it is. Um, I had done a few minor updates here and there, but, you know, there was only so much I could do. You know, I, I felt like even when I did the book in 2006, I actually interviewed, well, everyone I thought was still alive at the time. Um, so I was able to get, a, I felt like a, a pretty good version of the story, at least that I could put out. I mean, I... I had agreed when I when I did an interview with uh, with Ronald, the, the young man who at the time was a young man who was you know allegedly possessed. I had promised him that I would not use his name as long as he was alive, and so I didn't, and I never have, and I've never used it in anything. I didn't, you know, I I had some material at the time that was touchy, I guess, um, but some of that I didn't use because of family concerns and family privacy. But, you know, I, I did talk to a lot of people and I felt like I put out a pretty thorough book, but as time went on, you know, not only did I keep finding out more things and actually talk to more people and got more family stories and inside stories. Plus I actually found a couple more people who were still alive. Um, one of whom passed away just shortly after I spoke with him. Well, that happened to me a couple of times which I don't know what that says, but <laughs> that doesn't seem <laughs> right. good. You know, two people die like months later. Oh, great. So, but you know, I did get a, I did get contacted in 2014 about an Alexian monk who was there at the, at the hospital toward the end of the exorcism was involved in it, was there personally saw things firsthand and wanted to tell his story. He'd never talked about it because that had always been something they were not supposed to do, but he was knew he was, dying, he had cancer, he was in really frail health when I met him, and he just wanted to tell that story because he felt like it was important for it to get out there. So I, I got to meet him, and, and he really was the last one, well, except for Ronald himself, who passed away uh, in May of 2020. So I waited a year, you know, after he passed, uh, before I put out the book with using his name, family names, uh, a lot of uh, family information, that kind of stuff that I, you know, never felt right about putting in in the first place. So, right. yeah, yeah, it was, it's been, it's been a long, I mean, it's been something I've been dealing with for, I don't know, 20, 25 years now. And so it's, it's one of those stories where I kind of feel like there, there won't be another, I don't think I need another edition now. Right. So I think I, I finally feel like I gotten to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it and be finished with it. And you're talking about the people passing away not long after you talked to them. This story starts in 1949. So most of these people were well into their 80s, 90s. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most most of them were, were quite old um, by the time I, I did speak to them. Um, Father Halloran, who was a priest when I spoke to him, uh, but he was a Jesuit student at the time of the exorcisms. He was brought in to help. Uh, he was a, a big guy. So he was big, he was strong, he'd been a boxer, he'd been a football player, and uh, the priests who were conducting the exorcism knew he would be handy to have around, and he was. And But I spoke to him, and he was quite old when I spoke to him in 2005, and then he passed away a short time later. And then, but Br Brother Greg was, gosh, he was in his late 80s, almost 90, 89, 90, when I spoke to him, and you know he already knew he was uh, nearing his end. So, yeah, and everybody was fairly old. The youngest person involved was, of course, Ronald, who was only 13 when it happened. So, but even so, he was still, you know, by the time he passed away, still fairly up there. Right. 
And uh, for, for any of the listeners that don't know, if you've ever seen any documentaries or any read anything or even read the previous iterations of your book, Ronald has always been referred to as Roland Doe as kind of just a place name. Robbie, Roland, that kind of thing. He was given initially the, when the priest, let me back up just a little bit and say that when the exorcism began in St. Louis, the priests involved decided to keep a diary and they did so uh, because they wanted it as a how-to guide for another priest who might be coming along to do an exorcism because at the time there was no material. There was no literature. There was nothing like that. You know, it was 1949. Exorcisms just weren't commonly done. So they wanted something like that to put together. In the end, it wasn't released. Um, it, it kind of made its way into the wild uh, by accident, really. But it was never released. But he was referred to as Roland in that document, so that's kind of become his Roland Doe is what everyone knew him as, you know, which Robbie, he's often referred to as, but I mean, his nickname was Ronnie. So, I mean, that's, it was, it was pretty close. They didn't, yeah. they didn't really get real creative, <laughs> with <the laughs> pseudonym, you know, Roland, Ronald, you know, we just gonna, we're going to change a couple of letters around and we're going to make it that. So right. yeah, it wasn't, but it was enough to, to throw people off. Well, mostly because it was never, you know, was never really released. Um, you know, the, the diary was, was actually found in when they were tearing down the Alexian Brothers Hospital. I mean, there were copies out there, but people weren't passing them around. Um, it was released to the public after a copy was found. Uh, when the old hospital was being torn down, the, the rector of the hospital back in 1949, Brother Cornelius, had placed a copy of it in the room that they had used for the exorcism. And I know this sounds like a, you know, a scene from a movie or, or some kind of urban legend, but it is true. They really did close off the room and not use it again. And they left everything in it. They left a copy of the diary in there. And then when they were tearing down that old wing of the hospital, uh, that the diary was found. And, you know, that's, that's actually how it got out to the public. But it never was a huge sensation. That, that's all come along in the years that have followed. In the 90s, it, it became, it started to become a thing. People knew that The Exorcist was based on a true story, it was something that had happened in St. Louis, but it wasn't. It just wasn't widely known. Uh, even in the 70s, even after The Exorcist came out, there was some detail, but not much. And that was only because of some newspaper stories, and they're very vague, very vague. The ones that were printed early on. Um, so, and most of them only covered stuff that went on uh, around in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area where the family was actually from. And that's where everything kind of started. But none of them had anything to do or very little to do with what happened in St. Louis. You know, that didn't become a thing until after the exorcist and then really finally into the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, and whenever uh, William Peter Blatty wrote The Exorcist, um, he actually heard of the case because he lived, he was going to college in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah, he was at Georgetown. He was studying to be a priest. Um, and, uh, that actually, th th there was a story in the newspaper about, um, mostly about a poltergeist and then in, in the home of this family in Cottage City. And that was information that was given out by the family's Lutheran minister who had witnessed some of the strange activity in the Hunkler's home. And so he talked about it long after the exorcist had already ended in St. Louis in August of that same year, he talked about it at a meeting of a parapsychology club in Washington. And somebody reported it in the newspaper. And then the next thing you know, um, it's not just a poltergeist story, it's an exorcism story, which was pretty National Enquirer type <laughs> news right. at the time right. in 1949. But the you know newspapers being newspapers, they all copied each other and ran with it for a few days. And you know, like I said, the, the stories were very vague because no one had any real knowledge of what happened other than the family had gone to St. Louis and there had been an exorcism and whatever had been going on had stopped. That's, that's, there, there are like 15 newspaper articles in a paragraph. <laughs> that's pretty much what they all said, you know. So they didn't give a lot of information. But Laddie did, did read that there was some sort of diary kept, and he asked one of his advisors if he could, get, if he could see it. And they told him no, because there had only been about a dozen made and they were pretty closely kept guarded. Because when the exorcism ended in St. Louis, the archbishop who had given permission for it to happen 
uh, had it investigated, and the investigator said that it was inconclusive. That that is despite the fact that forty eight people signed affidavits that said that they witnessed supernatural activity, but they just said, you know, we don't think this is something that we should be talking about, so we're going to keep it quiet. And really, that had nothing to do with belief or disbelief in what was happening with the exorcism. It had everything to do with politics or at least the, the culture of the city at the time. Um, what you, the, the undercurrent to all this that, that most people don't know and the reason, the biggest reason why it was kept secret is because the Catholic Church was in the process of desegregating all of its churches and schools in St. Louis at the time. Now, this is 1949. So they were pretty early in the whole civil rights thing. And they were trying to do all this desegregation and people were really angry about it in St. Louis. It was not being met with a good response to the point that the archbishop had to threaten to excommunicate anyone who didn't go. And that's a big deal (laughs) to excommunicate anybody who didn't go along with his desegregation plan. So the idea of people out there talking about the church doing an exorcism in 1949 in the middle of all that was not something he wanted. I mean, that's why he asked them to keep it secret in the first place. And that's really the the main reason why nobody talked about it when it was over. I don't think that they thought it was not real. Uh, I think they, they did believe that it was real, but I think that it just talking about it was what was, you know, not going to be something they wanted to do. Yeah. So for anybody that doesn't know, let's start back at the beginning of how all this sure. started. So in 1949, Ronald started having issues and his parents uh, started calling people in for help. Right. Things started happening in the house. First, it was, you know, weird noises, things, you know, sound like they were inside the walls, tapping sounds, all kinds of things. Um, Ronald lived there with his mother and father and his grandmother, whose husband had passed away, that she lived in St. Louis, moved out to Cottage City, Maryland, which is a suburb of D.C., to live with the family. And they were hearing all these strange noises and things. And so they first they called an exterminator. Of course, that, that didn't do any good. And then the, the two women uh, began to believe that the house was haunted. And they believed it was haunted by a Roland's aunt, who was Edwin, his father's sister, who actually didn't die until after the activity started. So it's really, I mean, and I think I try to point that out as much as I can in the book. This was, was ridiculous, and it was only done because they didn't like her. And that is... That is true. They didn't like her. And so she made a convenient scapegoat for whatever was happening because now Roland, you know, was being attacked. He was being scratched and pinched and pushed. And, you know, he seemed to be going into some kind of trances and all kinds of things. So they contacted their uh, Lutheran minister. His name was Luther Schultz. He was the minister at their local church. And he, you know, witnessed some of the activity, invited uh, Ronald over to their home, over to his home so that he could observe him somewhere because if it was a trick that he was doing at home, he thought maybe taking him out of his you know comfort zone would reveal what was happening. Um, instead, he saw not only did he see things, you know, move around, but he actually saw Ronald be tossed out of a chair, uh, bed moving, shaking. I uh, saw him kind of levitate across the floor while he was sleeping. And he began to believe that it was a, just, it was a poltergeist and it was, You know, something that, and and this was coming into becoming a a normal thing with parapsychology people at the time, that it was being created by Ronald himself as the human agent. Um, This is, you know, at a time period when people really started to get into that idea uh, for the first time, really, you know, where they didn't blame it on some other kind of ghost, that it had to be the person that was causing the activity. Uh, Family didn't believe that, though. They still thought that they were being haunted by you know, this aunt or, you know, now who's now at some sort of evil spirit. And they contacted the Catholic church, the, the local Catholic church. Um, they were Lutherans, but grandma had been a Catholic and had converted to being a Lutheran. So she did have some idea of, you know, what the Catholics did with it. But the priests there didn't, they never, they suggested that they pray. Uh, they gave the family some candles and some holy water, but that was their complete involvement at the time. It wouldn't be until, you know, they went to St. Louis that the Catholic Church became involved. But unfortunately, there, <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, if you've watched it, and I know you've watched it, Eric, but if, if people have watched that 
the, the Discovery Plus documentary that I was in about the exorcism of Roland Doe, you're like, yeah, but you're leaving out the good parts. Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. leaving out the good parts because they didn't happen. You know, there was no Ouija board. There was no Ouija board that that Ronald was using to contact his aunt, and that's how he became possessed. That 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 none of that's true. Um, there's also a, a botched exorcism that supposedly took place at a hospital when. Uh, Ronald had been checked in, and, and that part, and Ronald was sent to a hospital to be checked out. They ran all kinds of tests on him to see if there was something wrong with him, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. But you know, the the, the legend is is that a, a priest came to uh, the the hospital and tried to exercise him there at the hospital, but that <laughs> that 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 didn't happen. Uh, Father Hughes, who supposedly did that, you know, was attacked by by Ronald. He, he got in a bed spring loose and. And, you know, ripped him up with it, stabbed him with the sharp end of it. And he was so traumatized, he went to a mental hospital and, you know, was never ha- able to have full use of his left arm again. I mean, it's just silly stuff, yeah. um, which was easily debunked because when I was out in uh, Maryland, I went to the church and spoke to the priest there and told him the story. He said, oh, yeah, I've heard that too. And I said, well, there's an easy way to to say that's not true. And so we went and looked through the records and found everything that Father Hughes was doing in 1949. None of them involved an exorcism, and he was never attacked or in a mental hospital because he was busy doing funerals, weddings, christenings, all, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, we had it in black and white that none of that ever happened. So I don't even know how that got started. I mean, I know that there was a priest that he worked with later in life, and after Father Hughes died, he was making up some wild stories. I mean, priests are human too, and this guy loved the attention. So I guess that's what it amounted to. I I really don't know why you'd make that up, but apparently he did. Anyway, after, you know, things continued to happen at the home and Ronald was being cut and scratched and things, uh, Mark started appearing on his body under his clothes that he couldn't have done. Uh, Again, we're, you know, we're basing this on the testimony of the family. And, but then, Later, there would be more people who would witness the same things. But markings appeared on his body that seemed to spell out words, and one of them was Lewis. And so her, his mother thought that this would be meant that they should go home to St. Louis, where they were originally from, where they still had family that maybe whatever this was would leave them alone. So off they went to St. Louis, which I always use as, a, as an idea to everybody, and I, I say this many, many times when I'm speaking about this and I say it in the book many times is that no matter what you believe when it comes to exorcism and that kind of thing, something had to have happened. I mean, something happened to this family that they would pack up and move halfway across the country. Right. Uh, And the, you know, and the, and the off chance that it would help. So, but it didn't help. In fact, things got worse when they got to St. Louis. Uh, One of Ronald's, um, his cousin, was studying at St. Louis University, which is a Catholic school, and she went to her advisor, uh, Father Raymond Bishop, and told him about what was happening. He came out, saw it for himself, thought that Ronnie might be possessed. Um, he went to his mentor, who was Father William Bowder, and told him about it. They both went back together. They witnessed things, you know, as far as seeing the bed shake and things move and you know, see, seeing Ronnie go into these trances and these convulsions that he was having. Um, and they were convinced uh, the archbishop gave them permission to do the exorcism as long as they kept it quiet. And it went on for the next six weeks, um, not only at the house where uh, the relatives lived, where the aunt and uncle, uh, Leonard and Doris Hunkler, lived in, in Bel Nora, which is right outside of St. Louis, um, not only at their home, but at the rectory at St. Francis Xavier Church. And then finally, well, back, after a brief trip back to Maryland, finally at the Alexian Brothers Hospital, which has you know, kind of become like the legendary site, but it's not there anymore. At least not that. The hospital is, but not that. Not the old hospital. The new one is in its spot now. But, um, but yeah, it went on for about six weeks, and 48 people witnessed things they couldn't explain. As far as him changing personalities, using different voices, uh, his incredible strength, levitations. When I um, when I interviewed Brother Greg, the Alexian monk who was in charge of helping with the exorcisms, he swore to me that he was there one night and had a hold of Ronald's ankles, and he said the boy levitated 12 inches off the bed. 
you know, he couldn't explain. I mean, he saw it happen. He had no explanation for it other than to say, and he said to me, you could feel the devil in that room. He said, I have absolutely no doubt he was demonically possessed. I mean, he was there, you know, I, I wasn't there. He was there. He saw it with his own eyes. Couldn't explain what happened. You have to, you have to give that some credibility. You know, this is a guy that was actually there. It's not just somebody standing around talking about it. You know, right. or even someone like me who's done all the research and I can tell you all the stories I want, but I didn't see them. It's the people who were actually there. Those are the people I took seriously, you know, whether it be in letters or whether it be in, you know, actual interviews that I did with them. Those are the people I, I can't, you know, I have to say, I can't sit here and go, well, they were imagining things because I wasn't there. Right. So, you know, in the end, there have been a lot of people who have said, oh, well, you know, it wasn't a demonic possession. I'm sure he was just mentally ill or, you know, it was a hoax. And, you know, well, I mean, for a 13 year old boy to pull off a hoax like this, I mean, this is, I mean, this is Oscar caliber performance stuff, which went on for four, almost four months altogether from, you know, when it started in January till it ended at the end of April. I mean, he fooled, he would have had to have fooled an awful lot of people. And at some point, wouldn't you just go, okay, that's the joke's gone too far. You know, after your every single night for hours at a time being yelled at and held down and pinned to beds and things for, you know, night after night after night. Right. So I think the hoax thing is, is pretty hard to believe. And as far as mental illness goes, yes, there are a lot of mental illnesses that were likely mistaken for demonic possession in centuries past or even in less time than that. But this again is one of those things where when you take all of it and you put it all together and you say, you know, here's, here's all the things that happen. What, what mental illness is this? Well, I've talked to several different psychiatrists, including some of absolutely no interest in this kind of thing. But when you give them all of these symptoms, I've been told, well, there simply is no single diagnosis that would fit all these things. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of different ones, but nothing that would fit them all. And I guess the other thing is, is, okay, so let's say he was mentally ill. Well, you know, let's just say that that was the case. Somehow he was miraculously cured of that illness. So isn't that paranormal on its own? Right. Because he never suffered from anything else after this, went on to lead a completely normal life. I, I'd say better than average, actually. I worked for NASA. I mean, I'd say he lived a better than average life as a rocket scientist. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, I mean, he really was never troubled by anything like this again. So whether you want to call it a, you know, a prank or if you want to call it that, you know, he was crazy, somehow it was cured, <laughs> you know, yeah. in an instant. So explain that one. You can't, you know, so it's a, it's such a bizarre story. And it's and when you, you take out the untrue elements of it, it's just as fantastical as it was before. I just think it's important that we follow the story for what really happened, not some of the other stuff, because that's crazy enough. Yeah. What really happened is scary enough. Yeah. And with, with stories like this, that I just stories in general throughout the paranormal, my first go-to question is what, what is the motivation for somebody to put a right. story out like this? And like you were saying, he went through six weeks of this exorcism and kind of torture and yeah. fasting and, you know, all, and the priests go through all this fasting and torturing themselves in a way. Mm -hmm. So what is right. their motivation? Right. They didn't want fame. Yeah. And it wasn't even brought really no. to the popular culture until the exorcists come out. And like you said, more right. so in the nineties. So these, in you know, these people aren't looking for fame and, and the guy wanted to stay anonymous until he passed away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he never really wanted to talk about it. And, you know, even when I interviewed him, he was like, well, you know, I can't really tell you much because I don't really, really remember much of it. And that was always a thing that the priests would talk about during the exorcism. They would talk about the fact that during the nighttime, this kid was a holy terror, but during the day, he was just a normal 13 year old boy. I mean, just calm, like to play baseball, read comic books, play board games. I mean, just a normal kid, you know? And so when I spoke to him and he said, you know, I just don't remember much of what happened. He said, all I know of it is it seems like someone else's life because the only story I have of it is other people's stories, you know? So he, he couldn't even tell me anything about it anyway. He wasn't trying to get famous. He didn't want anything to do with it. 
I mean, what possible reason could he have had to make this up in the first place? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I could see maybe at the beginning some of it being prank stuff to get out of school or whatever, but how do you keep that up, Right. you know, for months, you know, knowing that your family's driving back and forth, or traveling back and forth between St. Louis and home, and you're being drug all over the place, and you're getting screamed at every night and tied down onto beds, put into a mental hospital, into a, you know, a secure ward where you're going to be, you know, strapped to a bed. Who, who does that? You know, you just yeah. don't. Yeah, that's not something that you do. It's just not. And also back in the 40s and 50s, I mean, psychiatry and psychology were kind of barbaric. Mental hospitals, they had some barbaric yeah. <laughs> treatments and tests and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. And he, well, he's lucky he ended up where he did because with the Alexian brothers, they didn't believe in straight jackets or handcuffs or anything like that. Um, they didn't even have bars on the windows. But they kept one wing you know, as the secure ward where when there were patients who were out of control, they could be strapped to a bed, but they were not, they didn't, they didn't really follow a lot of the other standards of mental hospitals at the time. So, I mean, he was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> He's just lucky, you know, because someplace else would have been a lot worse than that. Yeah. And also what lends credibility to the story as well is there had, like you said, there had to be something going on with the family because they moved, they uprooted their family from Maryland yeah. and moved to St. Louis because they really believe right. that that's where they needed to be. Right. Right. Well, and you know, like I said, they were, they were originally from St. Louis. Their family was still there. You know, they moved out to that area before um, Edwin's job and then, you know, packed up and moved back. I mean, not permanently, obviously, but they didn't, he, he had to keep going back and forth uh, because of his job. Not, not all the time, but even so he's jeopardizing his job in a post World War II economy to go back to St. Louis as often as he did, you know, and, you know, had these long absences from work. So, I mean, he was, you know, and of course, back then, you know, there was only one income in the family. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all you needed. And that's all they were, all they had. So, I mean, he was jeopardizing that to try to get his son help, you know, and as much as I, and I'm not, I, I, in the book, I, I try not to be hateful, but I'm not a big fan of either mom or grandma uh, because both of them had their issues. And I think that, you know, a lot of the problems that, that Ronald had in school and things prior to all this happening had a lot to do with his smothering uh, <laughs> mother and grandmother. But even so, I, I don't think that they faked this. I mean, what possible reason could they have wanted for their son and grandson to be going through this. They, you know, there just, there just isn't one. There's not a good explanation for it being a hoax. I, I don't think. Yeah. After doing all this research for so many years, what do you think happened? Because you look at exorcism through like the guise of religion, but if you step outside of that, what do you think actually happened? Well, and that's the thing, you know, you can, you can look at a, pos I mean, possession is something that is much older than the Catholic church. I mean, this is something that's been around since the dawn of man. There have been stories of, you know, in the beginning of recorded time of people being possessed by whatever, you know, the gods, the, you know, whatever you want it to be. And honestly, we, we've put this particular case because it's become so well known and because it's so connected to the movie, it obviously falls into the domain of the Catholic church, which makes it a religious exorcism, which makes it a, some sort of, Christian devil, Christian God. But I think that, you know, I, I think that's why I don't rule this out because I, I know that, you know, these types of things are much older than Christianity. And I think that in ancient times, we all refer to these, whatever they are that are out there by different names. We call them angels. We call them devils, or demons or gods. I mean, I, you know, we don't know what exactly I think there are things that have been, boy, this is really, <laughs> I, don't know things, I feel like I'm talking in circles here, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think it's possible that he had encountered, this family encountered something that wasn't necessarily human, yeah. um, that had in, possessed or infested this boy for some reason, somehow, you know, there's probably an explanation somewhere that we'll never know what it is because it's so completely innocuous that you know, we, we don't know why he ended up being possessed. He didn't do anything. So, I mean, you know, you, you'll hear 
when you watch garbage on TV, you'll hear, oh, well, you know, they were you know practicing their cult or they were reading occult books or they were listening to heavy metal music or right. they were, you know, listening or playing with a Ouija board. Well, if that was the case, I'd have been possessed many, many times <laughs> over <laughs> you know, for all these things, right? But I don't think that it's that, uh, that simple. I, I just don't think the explanation is that simple, I guess. So I do think that, that it, there was something. There, there's too many... There's too many witnesses to things that just can't easily be explained for us to just write it off and go, oh, yeah, nothing really happened. It's all, a, you know, it's just all a hoax. You know, I, I don't think that we can do that. If we really look at it objectively, I don't think we can do that. But, yeah, I mean, I do think there was some sort of possession involved. I just think that the Catholic Church and I differ on what we want to call demons or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. So I do think he was possessed. I just don't, you know, I think we, we, we narrow it down too much to, to connect it to Christianity. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I've talked about many times on the show here, people like to put things in boxes cause it just makes us comfortable as humans. Sure. But sure. Absolutely. Especially yeah. with the paranormal and with stuff that we're talking about that we can't prove, but there's plenty of witnesses. You, you can't put that stuff in the boxes. It just doesn't work. Right. So yeah, there's, there's no easy answer with this. I mean, there's no easy label to put on it. And, uh, but I, but I definitely think that something happened for sure. Um, I just think that we have, we're all going to have different, different definitions of things. Yeah. So, because technically, technically we're going to get picky here. Um, what the church outlines as requirements for an exorcism, this case never met, but yet they granted permission anyway, which tells me that there was something going on here that didn't meet all of the you know, the church requirements, but they knew to take it seriously anyway. Yeah. So that, that I think is another clue as to the fact, the seriousness of all of this, you know, is that there really was something going on. Yeah. And the fact that they, that he went through extensive medical testing to make sure that it wasn't some mm -hmm. sort of mental illness, you know, back at that time with a new mental yeah, illness. Yeah. Or anything physical yeah. or yeah. Yeah. Any, yeah. Yeah. I think it all, like you said, lends credibility to the story and, so you've, you have to, I mean, you've dove into exorcisms in general, uh, just from reading the book, you, you have a lot of info mm -hmm. in there in the beginning about the rights of exorcism and, and that type of stuff. Did you come across any other cases that you thought could have been credible as well? Uh, you know, there, there are a few that, that possibly could have been, it's just so hard with the passage of time, you know, with a lot of these, you know, too much time has passed. There's no way to check the records on you know, like the exorcism that happened in, uh, you know, in Iowa in the 1920s. I mean, you had a lot of people who were there who swore to all of these things. But, I mean, if you think the story of Ronald Hunkler is hard to believe, that one's really hard to believe. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, that, that's some stuff that they ripped right off and put it right on screen in the exorcist. And so these are things that are completely crazy, but you're going to buy it because the movie's scary. And so, you know, you look at that and you think, well, man, you know, maybe something happened there, but man, I don't know about her being, you know, flown out of the, out of bed and pinned up on a wall, you know, 10 feet in the air, people tried to pull her down. And it's just hard for me to believe, you know? Yeah. So, and, and, and there's no way to talk to anybody who firsthand witnessed it. I mean, yes, there is an account by a priest who put something out but i mean that guy was kind of crazy <laughs> i mean he, he didn't really set some crazy things that i kind of followed him a little bit further in his career and he was a bit of a loon so it's kind of hard to know exactly what happened but you know when you get into more modern stuff you know there there was some you know a couple things that happened just a few years ago and then you get into the the story about uh, annalise michelle in germany and it's just that's just tragic you know, yeah. I mean, her story is, her story is just tragic. I mean, this is a girl who was, you know, the, you watch the movie version of it, the exorcism of Emily Rose, and it really looks like she's possessed. You read the real account of what happened and you, it's pretty obvious that this girl wasn't being treated for, you know, a variety of mental issues and she just became worse and worse. And then, you know, you got this priest involved who believes she's, possessed and really run things off the rails. I, I don't know, man. I, it's hard to, with some of this stuff, it's just so crazy and people have taken it just so far that, you know, you, well, I mean, that's, that's religion in general. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And you can't say much because, well, it's people's religion. Right. So you have to keep your mouth shut. 
you know, but um, I don't know. I, I haven't really, like I said, I, there's some older cases that are intriguing, but it's just hard to know. And I think there are probably real ones out there. Um, you know, I met a priest who is, a, is an exorcist and um, he just, you know, he tells me he works on a dozen cases a year and that most of it's infestations though, not actual possessions, but every once in a while a real possession comes along. And he didn't want to share any kind of details or talk about the people. So I, it makes me think that there may be more of this going on out there that is legitimate, but we'll never hear about it because it's kept quiet. You know, it's, it doesn't, I mean, just like this case, we wouldn't have heard about it if they hadn't leaked. We'd have never known. Outside of a small circle of people, we would know nothing about this story. Nothing. But a couple of people talked and off it went. And, you know, maybe that'll happen with something else down the line. It's hard to say. Yeah. But I think there's probably other ones out there, but we're just not hearing about it. Yeah. One of the reasons I want to talk to you about this real case, because of from reading your book, you know, like you said in the beginning, you can throw out all of the hype and all of the BS that people have said about this case over the years, and it's still a fascinating, crazy story with lots of crazy things happening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what that's I think one of the things that has appealed to me so much over the over time is because there is so much crazy stuff still left, even when we dismiss the silly stuff, there's so much crazy stuff. You just it's it, I believe me when I started, it's very hard to believe at all. You know, I mean, it really wasn't until I finally had the opportunity to talk to people who were there who saw things happen that you start going, you know, there may be something to this after all, yeah. you know, because I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've seen an awful lot of movies. I'm a big movie buff. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of exorcisms in the movies right. and I did, you know, and I'm like, Oh brother, you know, <laughs> uh, but when you get and you talk to people who've seen the real thing, you know, who are absolutely convinced, even if you're not, and they're absolutely convinced it, it, it can still, it can still affect you. It really can. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think people are are fascinated by this nowadays because you have a bunch of these ghost hunter shows that you know they get they get mm -hmm. possessed every episode. And oh, God, yeah, or they just yeah. everything's a demon, right. and you know, right. come on, and yeah, yeah, you know. and 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 so to talk yeah. about a story that really happened that really could have been somebody that was possessed, and all the evidence is there uh, for you to make up your own mind, but it kind of points in the direction that something happened. Right, right. Well, that's the way I feel too. And it's, it's always been my, my way of, of dealing with the story and presenting it to people is just to say, you know, you got to judge for yourself. I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to tell you what to believe or what to think. Right. I'm just laying this out there for you. This is what happened. Um, you can put whatever, you know, judgment on it you want, but this is what occurred. Decide for yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah. One of the big questions that I get uh, when I, go on other shows and you've probably had the same question. It's always the demon question. How, you know, cause I've been a paranormal oh, investigator yeah. for 25 years and I always get the question. Have you ever come across anything evil or demonic? And my answer is no, I've come across some asshole, uh, asshole too. spirits, yeah. <laughs> but, right, but always right. say if you're an asshole in life, probably gonna be an asshole in death. So exactly. That is exactly the same exact thing I've always said too. You know, there's negative stuff out yeah. there, but most of it's negative because I mean, there, there, believe me, I think there are other things out there, but I don't think they're common. Right. And I don't think that they're just in somebody's house. I think they're attached to a place or something, but um, yeah, I, you know, that that's, that's all about rating, right. you know, all uh, to people, when you watch TV, they want to hear about demons and I'm going to take that all the way back and blame it on the warrants right. who started all this demon crap and mixing it with ghost stuff back in the, 60s you know i'm gonna blame it on them because you know anybody can call themselves a demonologist these days which is exactly what ed warren did he was just ahead of the curve now you got him coming out the woodwork right. and it's like what makes you a demonologist oh well you know i read a book and okay great that's kind of like being in the 1800s and reading a book and deciding you're a doctor right, right. so it's pretty much the same thing so yeah i um yeah that's all about ratings and and you know getting their name out there but you know i i do find and this is off the topic, but I do find that a lot of that demon talk, uh, I noticed this back in like in the nineties when I was doing this stuff, a lot of the stuff about demons seems to all come from the new England there. Yeah. The people who, the people who 
started all that as far as mixing it in with, you know, paranormal investigation and things, all of it came out of New England. And I think that, that dates all the way back to the, you know, the Puritan mindset, you know, of the settlers in New England, you know, and I think that, that, that idea has been around for a long time there where it's not as common, say, out West. I, you know, I don't find that nearly as much. Uh, unless it's people from New England who are now in California doing TV shows. <laughs> so that's, you know, oh, and there it is. Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't know. That's just a, this is something I've noticed you know, dealing with this stuff. Yeah, and that makes sense because, I mean, if you look like the Salem witch trials and all the witch stuff, the majority of sure, that happened, sure. the majority of it happened in New England. And, oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And so that, they all, they blamed all of that on demonic possession and demonic things. Sure. And, you know, these women were supposedly worshiping the devil and all this stuff. So, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And I, li- I live in the South. I was born and raised in the Bible Belt. And really, I've never heard of, you know, demonic stuff around here. And, and all the places that I've been to and, and investigated, I've never come across anything either. And now, now yeah, yeah. being in the Bible Belt, there are a lot of religious people around here that think that anything paranormal is demonic. That's just kind of their Right. Thinking. Oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. It's yeah, it's of the devil no right, matter what. Right. Yeah. No, I, I know what that's like in the Midwest too. You get a lot yeah. of that. You know, it's certain faiths are just completely against the whole thing. So you've written over ninety books. Well, it's actually like hundred and thirty, but I <laughs> I just let that go. I don't know where that the number may be a little old, yeah. but yeah. I, I wrote a lot during the pandemic. So nothing else to do. Right, so. right. So and you just re re <laughs> uh, re released this uncensored version. So what else do you yeah. have coming up? Uh, what other books you got coming out? Oh, well, I've got, I've always got all kinds of projects. Um, I don't too many, I don't preview too many ahead yeah. of time just because I've run into trouble with that in the yeah. past. Uh, but I usually keep several different projects going at the same time as far as in different stages of completion. Like this is a research thing. This is just a book title on a list. And then, you know, suddenly one that I get a, a bug up my you know rear and decide, oh, you know what? I'm just going to do that one next. So I just, I don't ever like to plan. I don't ever like to announce because they don't know for sure which one it'll right. be. <laughs> right. You that know? Makes sense. Uh, and I go, well, it's coming. And then I wait, you know, five years. <laughs> and what happened to that book? Yeah, it's coming, but I don't know when. But yeah, no, I'm always busy. I, I it's what I like to do. It's my full time job. So it's, you know. Yeah. It keeps me off the streets, and I'm busy every day. Right. So. And people can always check out the American Hauntings podcast that you co-host. Yes, yes. And that is, you know, that's usually every other week. Um, for us, uh, right now in October, it's every week uh, we put out an episode. I'm, I'm trying to finish a season. We, <laughs> we break our show into seasons. And so we did a, we started a haunted Hollywood season with, you know, ghost stories from Hollywood and L.A. and, you know, murder and crime and all that, too. Uh, but we started it like a year ago. And so <laughs> it's really drug out. So I decided I want to wrap it up. So we just are doing one every week. So for Halloween. <laughs> yeah. And you also, if anybody's in, in, uh, up in Illinois, you have a bunch of tours that you do mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, we do. We do. And down in the St. Louis Alton area, we do a lot of that. We do stuff down there all year round besides tours. We do a lot of events and um, dinners and, and things like that too. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, we just try to try to stay busy, uh, especially after the last year and a half. You want to be as busy as you right, can. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and people can go check out American Hauntings, Inc., and that is Inc.com. Inc. is I-N-K, like you right, write with. Right. And all of your books are available there as well as Amazon yeah. and, and all the other yeah. places you can find books. A lot of them are on Kindle. Yeah, yeah. Most everything is almost everything. Yeah. And they can find you on Facebook, all the social medias, I'm sure, as well. Yep, all those places. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place, which is a full time job in itself. <laughs> sometimes it seems like, man. <laughs> yeah, when I was writing the intro, I was like, I, I want to make sure that I hit, make sure I hit the highlights, you know. And I know I probably left some <laughs> oh, sure. of, some yeah. of the stuff out. <laughs> I'm not worried yeah. about it. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about it. Well, so. thank you so much for coming on today and, and chatting. Yeah, sure, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. So I enjoyed it. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Stay safe out there. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, head over to The Unseen Paranormal Lounge on Facebook for all the latest updates and discussions about the show. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, or at unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And please rate, 
review, share, and subscribe to help more people discover the show. The Unseen Paranormal Podcast is proud to be the ambassador for paranormal for Verbal.com. A big thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. You can find more of his music on Apple, Amazon, or Spotify. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.